Well, good morning, church. Good morning, church. Man, it is so good to be here with you today. My name is Matt Dinsky. I'm the student pastor here at Fellowship Greenville. I know we got a few students out there. Hey, I want to, uh, some of you have been praying for me. You, you know that I, I've had some back issues this whole week leading up to this. Uh, for a few days, I wasn't able to walk. And um, so thanks for your prayers. I'm here. I'm able to walk. I can't turn. So I'm very like robotronic today. But, uh, you know, we were, we were talking through some ideas. And worst case scenario, we thought we might do a new type of sermon where basically I just kind of lay on my back here. They hover a drone overhead pick up an image and project it. It's kind of this like uh, fine arts <laughs> way of teaching, but thankfully we don't have to do that. I have imagined about a dozen times my back going out in the midst of this sermon and me crumbling to the ground while you guys watch. Is this part of what he's teaching? Is this like some drama incorporated? No, if I fall, I'm done. Will me off, please. But I'd like to welcome you to Fellowship Greenville this morning. Those of you in Auditorium 2, those of you watching on the live stream, whether you're at home or afar, thanks for joining us this morning as we worship and pursue a life in Jesus together and what that's all about and the life that he offers. Thank you for being here this morning. I don't get to be in here that often, so I'm excited to be in here with you guys today. Over the last few weeks, we've been looking in the book of 1 Peter and uh, that's where we're going to be today as well. So if you have your scriptures, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 Peter. If you don't, we'll have the verses on the screens for you as well. If you're at home, run and get a Bible right now, okay? I'm going to give you a minute to do it. Um, but the, the New Testament books are actually letters. And this is Peter writing a letter to a series of churches in what is modern-day Turkey, and he's writing them, he's pouring out his heart for them in the midst of some things they're going through. And the reason part of Fellowship Greenville goes through books of the Bible at a time or letters at a time is we believe that we can actually get the author's intent by looking at his cadence and his rhythm and what he's writing and why he's writing it. And so we've been in 1 Peter for a few weeks. We're going to stay in 1 Peter right on into 2 Peter as we look at this letter. And this is where we're going to be. And in this letter, Peter gives us this identity title that we've looked at over the past couple weeks. He calls us exiles. And this is kind of his word in this letter, this idea of being an exile. And kind of what he's getting at is that because of our association with Jesus, because of our belief in Jesus, our vertical values that are not now aligned with the ways of Jesus in some way or another put us at odds with our horizontal culture that we once formerly belonged to. So when we believe in Jesus, the ways of living according to Jesus may not line up with the ways of our culture. This is a pretty understandable idea, right? And this was certainly happening in Peter's day. The, the believers of this time were being persecuted. There was public graffiti or public instances of, of Christians being mocked or sometimes even beaten. They were being robbed uh, at times, people breaking into their homes simply because they were Christians. And Peter is writing them with this idea, expect this to happen, you're exiles. You no longer belong to the culture. You're an outsider. You've been marginalized. You've been ostracized. You're on the fringe. This is what an exile life looks like. You no longer belong in the culture that you once belonged in. And he's giving us this idea that in some ways we are spiritually homeless. We have a permanent home that Jesus is bringing, but it's not yet fully here. And we are kind of in a no man's land, wandering as exiles as we are now aligned with Jesus because those values and beliefs have put us in a little bit of a rift with the world around us. And we cannot expect this world to align itself with Jesus. We need to understand that we are exiles. This is Peter's identity marker in his letters. When I was in seventh grade, I had an interesting experience. I grew up in East Tennessee. Go Vols. No. Okay. It's the other orange. I grew up in East Tennessee, and uh, I had a really cool childhood. Uh, for a lot of it, I grew up in kind of this like log cabin out in the country, and uh, we had this big open area and this big yard. And... Uh, Two, two Alaskan Malamutes, two Huskies, and a Dalmatian. I mean, it was just cool, man, right? Like, so when I was in kindergarten and first grade, you know, you're making friends, 
You're learning the social structures, who's who, who put their stuff in the wrong cubby. You're learning all of it, right? So I remember my mom had a few uh, parties for my classes during those times. We had like a Halloween party. We had this cool Easter egg hunt. And so I was making all these friends in kindergarten and first grade. In second grade, my family moved to Kentucky. Go Wildcats. <laughs> One. <laughs> Amen. Uh, we moved to Kentucky. And, um, and I was there for a while. And I tried to keep in touch with some of my friends back home. We were pin pals, which is like a sacred covenant of friendship. If you're pin pals, you are pin pals until you die. And uh, so I was pin pals with a few of my friends from Tennessee and um, finished sixth grade in Kentucky. And right before my seventh grade year, we moved back to Tennessee. Same town, same people. So I was excited because I wasn't the new kid, right? I was the returning kid. And if anyone has ever had to transition schools and you've had to be the new kid, then you know how hard it is to be that new person. Just this, you feel like you don't belong anywhere. But I wasn't the new kid. I was the returning kid. And I was really excited to see my friends again and hang out with them again and like catch up. I mean, it had been four years and I was excited. And I remember one of those first days back at school, I went up to one of my best friends. We had been best friends in kindergarten first. I mean, sleepovers, hanging out all the time. Like this was my dude. And I went up to him and man, he was around some, some new friends. I guess he had made in four years. <laughs> and I don't think he had the same agenda that I had to be friends anymore because he was rude to me. He, uh, he called me a name that hurt my feelings, <laughs> and I was so thrown off. Like, I went up to him, I was like, dude, what's up, what's up? And he was like, hey, insert name. And I was like, oh, why did you say that? I thought we were boy. I mean, he, he, apparently this is how they talked. I just missed the memo. I didn't know these dudes talk like this to each other. They call each other all sorts of names, and I was left out of the loop. So here I am four years later coming back, and he dropped it on me, and I was so hurt and confused and shocked. I was like, dude, what's the deal, man? I got pictures. We went to Chuck E. Cheese for my birthday party. We danced with Chucky. That robotic mouth, we were there, bro. And now you're not my friend. Okay, man. Like, I didn't get it. I didn't understand what had happened. I felt so out of the loop. I was so, like, the rug was pulled out from under me. And I felt like an outsider in the midst of people that I knew and that at one time had accepted me. And that's what Peter is getting at in his letters. Your faith in Jesus is going to lead to this identity where you might feel like you don't belong anymore, even though you're around people who you know very well, who at one time you belonged with, who at one time you shared similar values in life with. It might be your coworkers, it might be your friends, it might be your family, but Peter's point is you are now living among a culture because of your belief in Jesus that doesn't align itself with Jesus. And you will feel that, that tension, that strain, that pull, and it's not comfortable. You have to understand you are in exile. You are wandering in a foreign land. You are a stranger in this world because this is not our permanent home, we believe. This is Peter's whole emphasis. You are an outsider among people that you might know. Now, the problem with this is, and I want to throw this word up on the screen, the problem with this is all of us deep down have a desire to belong. We have this this deep-seated desire to belong. We want to know who our people are. We want to know who our crew is. We want to know who our tribe is. We want to know who's got our backs. We want to know when we wake up in the morning, who can I rely on in this life? Who are my people? I want to belong desperately. We all have this desire. I don't know if you've ever noticed it or not, but you do. And it's weird, it's a paradox because our culture is so individualistic and yet we desperately want community. I think it's because you take a peek in Genesis, the creation account, God has created us in his image, Genesis 1, 26 and 27. And God himself is a micro community. God is persons, he is three in one and one in three. I know it's a mystery, but created in that image, we have this DNA imprinted on us. We crave relationships. We were created by God who is relationships. 
and we crave it. We desire to belong. And this desire is so powerful that we will actually derive both our identity and our purpose from where we feel like we belong. We will define who we are and what we're about in this life based on those who will accept us. I had a friend one time, he was a, a father of some of, uh, some of my students, and we led a small group together, and he was saving up for a brand new truck, all right? I don't know if you've ever been there. It can be expensive, it's a big decision. And he had saved up for a long time, and he was gonna buy a brand new truck. He was worried, though, because his friend groups would give him a hard time if he didn't buy either a Ford or a Chevy, right? He bought domestic, right? Like, he, he was worried. Even though Toyota makes a far better truck. Sorry. Sorry if that offends you, but they do. And he desperately, he wanted a Toyota Tundra, man. He, was, he, was, he had all the bells and he was ready to do it. But he was worried that, man, if I get that, my friends are gonna make fun of me because I got a foreigner. I was like, dude, who cares about your friends, man? You'll make new friends in that thing. Bro, hit that thing, right? Like, and he did. He got the Tundra, and he loves it. But where we belong determines so much of how we perceive our identity and our purpose and sometimes even our worth and value. And the problem, the at-odds factor of Peter's letters as he writes is being in exile means you do not belong. But we want to belong. And so we, we are at a, a, a tension, a, a tug of war. There is a rift in our hearts between desiring to follow Jesus and desiring to belong. And the longer we follow Jesus, the more of an outsider we may feel, but we want to belong. And so then we hit this crossroads of, well, maybe I can just forfeit a few of my beliefs in Jesus to be socially accepted here. This happens all the time in college. A lot of my students fall away. Why? They're homesick. They're lonely. If they forfeit beliefs, they'll be accepted. I see it all the time. We want to belong. Peter says, but you're in exile. And these are in opposition to one another. So I want to jump into uh, 1 Peter, Peter's first letter this morning. We're going to start in, in verse 13. But I want to lay out three foundational beliefs that I think Peter has as he writes his letters. And if we can understand these beliefs, they will help us understand this passage so much more. Peter's first belief as he writes these letters is that following Jesus is difficult. It is hard. And man, if you're in here this morning and your ears just perked up and your eyes just got open, you're like, oh dude, you can't say that out loud. Let me encourage you. It is difficult to follow Jesus. And one of the things that our culture does pretty well, that our church culture, Christian culture in this nation can do pretty well, is shame you if you ever have a hard time in the faith, even though we all have a hard time in the faith. And this is almost taboo to talk about. <gasps> a pastor said it's hard to follow Jesus. It is hard to follow Jesus. And Peter knows this, and he knows this for two reasons. Number one, you will suffer. You will be persecuted. They were already experiencing persecution, and soon, in the next few years, widespread martyrdom of Christians would take place mass murderings of Christians. Peter sensed this bubbling up to the surface and he knew it would be hard to follow Jesus because you will suffer for your faith. When you're in exile, the culture does not understand what you're about. And Peter knows that discomfort is part of faith in Jesus. And let's be honest, we crave comfort, sometimes more than we crave Jesus. So he knows it's hard. Second. Peter knows just because you believe in Jesus does not mean your desire to sin has completely evaporated. It wouldn't be called temptation if we didn't want to do it. There are things you are drawn to. Sin sings a siren song and it lures us back. Peter knows that this is a constant battle in our minds. Now hopefully as we're more and more faithful to Jesus, the desire to sin will be less and less, but it's not completely gone. You're driving down the road, Someone cuts you off abruptly, violently. Rarely do we pause and say, God bless that person. Mm. I hope they get to where they're going so safely, right? Like, and even if it's under our breath, like one of the things Jesus teaches in the Sermon on the Mount, right? It's not just that your attitude leads to action. It's that your attitude is the same thing as action. What happens in here is just as bad as what comes out here. And, and Peter knows we have a desire to sin. There is something in us that is 
at odds with what God is calling us to be because we're still in our old bodies that have been affected by sin. He knows this. It's difficult to follow Jesus. His second uh, underlying belief is that it is worth it. So he kind of assumes the hypothetical question. I mean, Peter, man, what's the draw? This is a terrible elevator pitch, by the way. <laughs> like, hey, you want to believe in Jesus? It's so hard. <laughs> but Peter assumes this rhetorical question. Yeah, but is it worth it? Yes, it is worth it. And all throughout his letters, he talks about the hope that we have in Jesus and what he's done for us and how good it is and why it's worth following him and giving up everything for him. It is worth it. And he would identify it's worth it because Jesus gives us hope in the here and now. It's not just some, oh, I have hope when I get to heaven. We have hope here and now, but also eternal hope, forever hope in the name of Jesus. But also, Jesus changes our perspectives. If you heard Jim's sermon last week, phenomenal sermon. If you haven't listened to it, go listen to it online. But Jim identified that when we follow Jesus, our perspective is changed, and things that we at one time saw as obstacles in the way of our plan for life have now become opportunities that we embrace because we know these are part of God's plan for our life. We have a different perspective. It is worth it to follow Jesus. And then Peter's third underlying belief is that Jesus is growing, actively growing his family through Numbers 1 and 2. In the context of Peter, you have to understand, and this is pretty radical, that your identity as an exile who endures suffering and is tempted by sin but resists, which separates you from the world around you and the difficulty therein, and your hope in this present life and the life to come and your new perspective of positivity on the things that are happening to you is a beacon of light to the world who is looking at your life wondering what is different about you. And this is how Jesus is actively growing his family, bringing other brothers and sisters into the flock as they look at your life in the midst of pain and difficulty and discomfort and ostracism and marginalization. They are watching you and saying, dude, he's got hope. Something is different about this person. What is it? And Peter knows this is how Jesus is growing his family. If we can wrap our minds around those three ideas, it will help us understand this passage much, much more thoroughly. So let's jump in. Here we go, verse 13. 1 Peter, verse 13. Peter begins this way. I'm just gonna kind of read and unpack it as we go. Peter says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, let your hope, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So I'm gonna pause because 13 is kind of its own thought here. Peter says, man, as exiles, I know you're having a hard time. I know it's difficult. Following Jesus is difficult, right? Because of suffering and because of a temptation to go back to your old ways. It is worth it, but it's difficult. Peter says, okay, so let me reorient your perspective. Set your hope on the grace of Jesus. And this grace of Jesus is grace that will be brought to you at the second coming of Jesus, but it's grace that you already have because of the first coming of Jesus and because he gives it freely. It's inexhaustible as you use grace. It's not like the pool of God's grace somehow goes down a few levels. It's inexhaustible. It's undepletable. You can't use enough grace. Grace is the fuel which Christians burn on a daily basis. It's, it gets us through the day. Peter says, this is our hope, the grace of Jesus Christ. Our hope is not in this world. Our hope is not in the fact that we belong to a country or culture. Our hope is not that our neighbors like us or accept us. Our hope is not that we feel like we have a people. Our hope is in the grace of Jesus Christ because he gives it to us freely and without end. It is our fuel and our hope. I once had a mentor, professor in college tell me, that a believer should be burning through grace like a 747 burns through jet fuel. Just And he wasn't talking about abusing it, taking it for granted, he was just identifying you need it every second of every day. It's grace, that's where our hope is. But Peter kind of prefaces, his, prefaces this idea with two participles. He says, listen, 
prepare your minds for action and be sober-minded. Now, these are kind of two interesting thoughts, so let's unpack these a little bit. This prepare your minds for action, this is an interesting way of saying something. In fact, Peter says this so uniquely that the English translations don't pick it up. They, they don't even touch it. They kind of translate it a different way. But Peter takes this Old Testament idea and inserts it into a modern day way of thinking. But in the Old Testament, you know, the fashion decisions of, of men was long, flowy robes. They're in the arid desert. It's nice and hot, dry. So they had these flowy garments. Occasionally, a nice breeze would come and cool off everything. And it was nice. It, it helped them to function and breathe. But occasionally, there was work to be done. There were things that needed to happen that a robe would get in the way of, that these long flowy garments and these long pieces of fabric might hinder you from doing. And so in the Old Testament, there was this phrase, gird your loins. I don't know if you guys have ever heard this before. It's kind of a weird phrase. But it literally meant, man, pick up the robe, roll up the fabric, tuck it into your waistband because your legs need some mobility. There's work to be done. We might have to run. We might have to travel. The enemy might be advancing. We might have to fight. But all throughout the Old Testament, you see this phrase, gird your loins. In fact, God even uses this phrase when he's talking to Job. He says, gird your loins, Job. Like, it's time to do some work, bro. And Peter is using that literal phrase here when he says, prepare your minds for action, it literally translates to gird the loins of your mind, right? You ever read that in English, you'd be like, dude, I'm never picking up a Bible again. That is some weird stuff. My mind has no loins, okay? And I don't know how to gird it. Peter is saying, pull up the robes of your mind. There's work to be done. Or in other words, roll up the sleeves of your mind. He's, he's talking about living as exiles and setting our hope on the grace of Jesus, but he knows this is not a passive endeavor. He knows if we go on autopilot, it won't happen. And so for Peter, it's not just that the gospel saved you, the message of Jesus saved you, it's that it sustains you. For Peter, he understands you need to decide to follow Jesus and decide to follow Jesus and decide to follow Jesus. It is an ongoing, it is a once in time and ongoing thing that we daily decide and sometimes even hourly and sometimes even minutely decide, I will follow Jesus here and now. But why does Peter write this way? Foundational belief number one, it is difficult to follow Jesus. It is difficult to follow Jesus. Peter knows this, and he's encouraging us to set our hope on the grace of Jesus, but in order to do so, to literally gird the loins of our mind, to roll up the sleeves of our mind. It's time to put in work. You're gonna have to make some hard decisions if you really wanna see this through to the end. You can't autopilot this thing. And then he says, be sober-minded, which on face value, we kind of tack, tack on this whole, like, oh, I bet he's talking about alcohol, right? Well, that's part of it, but it's, it's deeper than that. He, he's, he's talking about the intoxicating effect that sin has, sin in general. Remember, it's difficult to follow Jesus. Why? You'll suffer, and there's still a desire to sin, and Peter knows this. And his, his idea here is <clears throat> the more you give in to the ways of the culture that you once left behind, the more disoriented you become in your bearing of where Jesus is. Your equilibrium is thrown off. You're kind of stumbling through life. You've become intoxicated with the ways of the world and you've lost your sense of bearing. You are stumbling along. You have let the guard of your mind down and now you have become intoxicated with the world and with culture. It is a larger draw for you than Christ's likeness. And he's using these two ideas to say, no, 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 it's time to keep our minds sharp and to have self-control, to be sober-minded so that we have a hope set on the grace of Jesus is not a hope set on the ways of the world because he knows the draw, the isolation of feeling lonely as an exile and the temptation to say, dude, if I just forfeited a few of these beliefs, they would take me. If I just picked up a few of those behaviors, they would take me. And Peter's saying, you don't understand those consequences. That leads to other stuff and that leads to other stuff. So have a sharp mind, be self-controlled, it's time to put in work, decide to follow Jesus, set your hope on his grace, not on the belonging that you desperately want in this world. He goes on to talk about 
this next main idea in verse 14. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. This is coming out of verse 13. Don't go back to that. Be sober-minded, be self-controlled. Roll up the sleeves, come on. Don't go back to the ways of your former living former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. So he quotes here, you shall be holy for I am holy. He quotes Leviticus. He, he cherry picks this Old Testament passage and kind of inserts it right here. And Peter's saying not only do we set our hope on the grace that Jesus gives, but we need to be holy. Now this word is a church word. And it's one of those words like we know what it means, but we kind of don't know what it means. And man, if, if you haven't rolled in Christian circles very long, you, you, don't, you may not know, and that's totally fine. So let's unpack it. All throughout the Old Testament, G, uh, Peter is using a Leviticus reference here. And the context of Leviticus is the Exodus. And so God's people are enslaved under an oppressive ruler, Pharaoh. And he has them in shackles and slavery, and they're praying for a deliverer. And God sends this man named Moses. And Moses delivers his people out of slavery, and they go on this kind of limbo journey. They wander through the wilderness. They're going to a land that's promised to them, but they're not there yet. They're no longer slaves in Egypt, but they're not settled in their new land. They are exiles. They are a people without a land, and they're wandering in the midst of this wilderness. And during this time, God is giving them instructions on how to live in a relationship with him. And part of what that meant is he regularly and repeatedly would call them, be holy, be holy, be holy. So here's what that means. To be holy literally means to be set apart, to be distinctively different from the world around you. You see, in the Old Testament, God had this idea and plan for his people. I want you to dress differently than the nations around you. I want you to have a different diet than the nations around you. I want you to talk differently. I want you to get a different haircut than the nations around you. I want you to do everything different than the nations around you. Why? Because I want them to see how different your life is and the hope that you have through your relationship with me so that when they look at you and observe you, they will notice there is something undeniably different about this entire people group and they seem to have hope. What is it? And that will translate to an invitation to them into this hope. God's desire for Israel in the Old Testament was always to be set apart or distinctively different so that they would be a light to the nations. And Peter quotes Leviticus to apply it to us. He says, hey, you be distinctively different to be set apart. This is a calling for us who follow Jesus, who at one time were in slavery under the oppressive ruler of sin and our shackles and chains were broken by our deliverer, Jesus, who has brought us and is bringing us to the promised land of heaven. Peter is reflecting these ideas in the midst of your journey. Be holy, be set apart, be distinctively different from the world around you. For the purpose of them seeing the hope you have, set your hope on the grace of Jesus, the hope you have in the midst of your exile. It's difficult to follow Jesus, it is worth it. When other people see that you have hope in the midst of that difficulty, they will be drawn to it. Be distinctively different, be set apart. Now here's what Peter doesn't say. And sadly, a lot of Christians over the years have interpreted it this way and taken it this far. Peter says, be set apart, but nowhere does he ever say, be set above. You see, Christians are pretty guilty of understanding, man, I no longer belong in the world. I'm supposed to be in the world, but not of it, right? And our strategy to be set apart is to somehow, all right, well, if I'm in exile, I'm just gonna push everyone else away too. And we remove ourselves from the very world which Peter is saying they need to see the light and hope that you have. Our approach to holiness is to ostracize everyone else. And when we exclude everyone who doesn't understand who Jesus is or what he offers because we don't want to take on the ways of their living, we also nullify the very method that Jesus himself modeled which was to immerse himself in a world and draw sinners to himself. The strategy of the believer 
can never be, should never be, to have a mindset that we're above others because we believe in Jesus, and if I associate with others who don't, I am therefore participating in their lifestyle. No. God's design for us is never to remove ourselves from the world. God asks us to immerse ourselves in the world but not absorb the culture of the world. It's a difficult calling because a Christian has to say yes and no simultaneously, has to understand there are things in culture that I can participate in that are good for me, that are fine for me, and there are other things that I probably shouldn't. And sometimes that's a gray area. It's not always black and white. And that's why Peter is calling us, gird the loins of your mind. You gotta have sharp minds. You gotta be ready for this. You gotta be on guard because it's not easy. It's difficult to follow Jesus, but it is worth it. But if our approach to holiness if our approach to being set apart is some behavioralism, rule-following, judgmental, legalistic strategy where we take pride in how much we're obeying and look down on others because they have no idea what Jesus offers or who he is, we've missed the entire point. And that group of people, let me remind you, is the Pharisees, which is who Jesus constantly rebuked. That is not what God is has in mind for his people. He's always desired us to be a light to the nations, not separate ourselves from the nations. Set apart, not set above. Distinctively different, not removed from. It's a hard, hard line. We're in the world and not of it. That's why the first command here is, get your mind ready for this. Set your hope on, on the grace of Jesus, not on the ways of the world. Be set apart. He then transitions, verse 17, if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear through the time of your exile, knowing that you are ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot, another Old Testament reference here. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that you, so that your faith and hope are in God. So this is kind of the final thought in this little passage that we're in, and Peter's last words are a little uncomfortable on American ears, on our culture, because there's a word in there, fear. Peter says, conduct yourselves with fear. This is kind of the, the third biggest command in this, in this little passage here. Conduct yourselves with fear. So what does that mean? Because at face value, that's like, dude, that doesn't seem to line up. Are you saying I'm supposed to be afraid of God? I mean, Peter certainly goes on to unpack this. He says, listen, God is a judge, and in the final days, he judges impartially according to each one's deeds. And he's, he's giving a sobering thought to these believers who were exiles. He's telling them, listen, man, you don't get gold stars and extra credit just because you claim the name of Jesus. Like, God's not going to be like, well, you lived a pretty bad life, but you claim the name, so I guess you're in. God judges impartially according to each one's deeds. But it's not a fear tactic even though he uses the word fear. It's not some scare tactic to set you straight. It's not some like guilt trip or shame a motive here. Because we know, look through all of scriptures, we know, Romans 8, 1, we are uncondemnable because of our faith in Jesus, that, that God literally views us through the filter of the blood of Jesus and he deals with us as he's pleased in him. We are perfect in position, though not yet in practice. We know that we're uncondemnable because of Jesus. The author of Hebrews lays this out all over the place. Because of Jesus, we can draw near to God with full confidence and assurance, firm in the faith. We don't have to be afraid of the presence of, like we have this affirmation. We have a confidence in Jesus. So Peter, what do you mean when you say we ought to live with fear? Conduct ourselves with fear. I think what he, he's doing two things, I think. One is, he's reminding us God is God and he is a judge, and we should take that seriously. And the verses that flow out of this affirm that. 
he reminds us, you've been bought, you've been ransomed, you've been paid for, and it's not been with things that perish like metals, silvers, or gold. You have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ himself. Peter is orienting our minds towards this idea that in the eyes of God, you are worth the death and resurrection of Jesus, and God himself put his son to death and raised him from dead so that you could be bought by the blood of Jesus. That is no light payment. So don't ever take that for granted. Be careful about what you do. Don't ever, again, he, he kind of has this idea, don't just autopilot life. You've got to decide. You've got to gird the loins of your mind. You've got to decide this thing over and over and over. Don't take it for granted. You've been bought with the most valuable thing there is, the blood of Jesus. But I think Peter is also calling us into, we need to understand that we, that our hearts, my heart, is susceptible to wander away from Jesus if I'm not careful. All of us. Now I know you go into a relationship with Jesus, your agenda is not, yeah, I'll probably follow him for a few years, see how that goes, and I don't know, I'll reevaluate. Kind of like a refinancing of a mortgage, right? Like we, we really don't approach it that way, but if we're honest, we see that happening a lot. After a few years, ah, this just wasn't what I thought it was, maybe I'm not into this thing, or like a trial run, right? Peter knows, foundational beliefs, it's difficult to follow Jesus because we're drawn back to sin. He knows that some part of us will desire to belong to this world more than endure the suffering that comes from being in exile. But in Peter's theology, it is better to suffer than to sin. And he's giving us this sobering idea, be cautious, be careful, conduct yourselves with fear, make sure that you do not slip into your old ways. It's possible to do. Even though you claim Jesus, it is possible for this decision and this decision and this decision to add up to let you drift away from this faith you claim. So let's liken it to, a, to this analogy. Imagine a professional race car driver. He gets out on the track and he has full confidence in his driving skills, in his ability, in his equipment, in his car. But that driver knows I've gotta stay sharp, I've gotta stay alert. Every movement I make, every micro movement will determine something here. And if that driver ever just checks out, goes on autopilot and starts to daydream, there is a serious risk of an accident waiting to happen. So Peter is saying, no, we have confidence in Christ. There's nothing to fear. For those who believe in Jesus, we know that that faith leads to good works. That's the whole book of James. So it's not like good works will flow from our faith. He's not saying live in fear. Hear him live with fear. It's very different. He's saying, have confidence in Christ, but no, if you ever autopilot this thing, if you ever start daydreaming, if you ever take the blood of Christ for granted, if you ever just think, oh, I'll just get through, I'll just get by, I'll kind of blend secular and holy together, and I don't know, man, I'll kind of live on the fringe of, I want to belong in this world, but go to the next world. Peter's saying, dude, you got to live with fear in that. That's a dangerous mentality that could lead you away from Jesus. Conduct yourselves with fear because one day God will look at those works. It's not a scare tactic, it's a sobering idea. But it's also packed with hope. We've been bought by the blood of Christ. Jesus has given himself for you. He bled out so that you could live. He gave his life so that you could have it. So Peter kind of, in this little passage, the three main thoughts are, Set your hope on the grace of God, the grace of Jesus. Be holy, be set apart, be distinctively different. And live with fear, not in fear, but with fear. Now he transitions out of this, and we've got a, just a final few verses here. In verse 22, he, he kind of brings us into this new thought, or so it seems. But if you're careful and you have the eyes to see it, it's actually, I think, the climax of this whole passage. And I'll be honest with you, as I was studying this passage and pouring over it, I missed the cadence and the flow of his writing here. And I, I kind of thought this was a break in the writing and led to something else. But I think it's actually the climax, the peak, the pinnacle of what he's trying to get at. So Peter, in verse 22, he says this, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth, for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. That verse, and I know it's so hard to get, it's so easy to miss, but that verse is like Peter's punch, his knockout blow in this idea. Because foundational beliefs, it's difficult to follow Jesus as an exile. 
It is so worth it, and Jesus is growing his family through Numbers 1 and 2. And this, this is that number three. You, you're you're going to see it. Peter says, you've purified your souls by obedience to the truth for the purpose of a sincere brotherly love. This family love that belongs in the body of Christ. Now, all throughout scriptures, we know we're supposed to love our neighbor, love the stranger, love the foreigner, love people we don't know. Yes, 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 and amen. But in this particular passage and this language, Peter is talking specifically about the family of God, those who believe in Jesus. Why? Why is he, why is he honing in on that? Well, for, I think, a couple reasons. One, I think Peter is encouraging his audience, and he knows, man, you desire to belong. You wanna have a tribe, you wanna have a people, but you're in exile, but let me remind you, you do belong. You belong to the most in crowd there is, though you don't feel it, you have a family and its fellow believers all around the world. And Peter is encouraging his audience saying, you do belong, you do have people, you do have family, it's Jesus, and if you're in with Jesus, you're in with his people. But I think Peter is also getting at this idea, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love, love one another earnestly from a pure heart. What does this have to do with being an exile in a foreign land? Because Peter's foundational belief number three, Jesus is desiring to grow his family through your identity as an exile as you suffer and resist sin, your identity as an exile as you hope and have positive perspectives. And when the outside world looks at believers living lives like that, it is appealing. This goes back to his call to be holy, to be set apart. Why should we be set apart? So that the nations around us, the people around us, when they look in from the outside, they see something different, something unique, something they can't articulate, and they want it. When they observe our communities, they will see, man, that dude just lost his job, but he's smiling. How is that possible? I don't get it. Man, that person is sick, and look at all these people coming to visit him. Does he have that many friends? I had no idea. Man, this just happened, and yet they have this perspective that's contagious. I wish I were more positive. Like, when the outside world looks in on believers in the way that we're supposed to be living and loving one another, it is a contagious light that is irresistible to those who don't have it. And that's Peter's point. You're exiles, but you're not supposed to remove yourself from the world. You're supposed to integrate yourself into the world just like Jesus did. Loving one another in Peter's mind is the missional approach to reaching this world around us. Belonging in Jesus and in his family with his people is not just how we survive as exiles, it's how we invite others into this. Belonging to Jesus, belonging to Jesus and his people, it's not just how we survive, it's how we invite. Because Peter knows the world wants love. The world wants hope. We convince ourselves that the world actually offers it, but it doesn't, and we know that, and there's a sense of loneliness that comes through living the world's ways too. And Peter knows, man, if, the, if those who claim to follow Jesus would actually love one another the way that Jesus asks us to love one another, the world would want in. But we don't. We're too concerned with our own preferences and opinions. We're too concerned with politics. We're too concerned about protesting this thing and writing up signs and standing on the corner for that thing. We're too concerned about denominational rifts and splits. We're too concerned about our opinions. We're too concerned about the little itty bitty things that really don't matter at all. We get caught up in all that nonsense and the church splits and the church fights and the world on the outside looks in and says, man, what do they have to offer that we don't already have here? It doesn't seem hopeful, it doesn't seem unified. Look in the book of Acts at the early church. They had all things in common in one mind. Peter knows if we can get there, if we can display love to a world who is desperate for love, it will be like a lighthouse casting a brilliant light on a dark horizon where ships are lost and without safe harbor, and they will be guided into this thing. Peter knows this is not just how we survive. This is how we evangelize. We love one another. But here's the deal. 
because he's writing specifically to believers, so let me talk specifically to believers. This is more than a Sunday morning occurrence. You come here once a week and we whet our appetites for Jesus and we worship some, but then we go Monday and we're reminded of the fact that we're in exile and we're lonely and it's hard to follow Jesus. Peter is saying, dude, if, if we're gonna get this thing, if we're really gonna apply this thing, we need to love one another every single day, which means we gotta be invested in one another, curious about one another's lives, digging deep in one another's hearts. That requires vulnerability, that requires trust, that requires commitment. It is so difficult, but it's so worth it, Peter says. Why? Because Jesus is growing his family through the fact that you love one another in the midst of pain and suffering. This is more than just us meeting once a week. It's also more than us inviting those who don't believe in Jesus to church, although that's a great thing. And if you do that, keep it up. But you gotta understand, when we invite our friends and our family who don't believe in Jesus, when we invite them to church, and this is like our territory, right? Like they don't know this language, they don't know these songs, they don't know this story. We're, we're inviting them into this thing that they're unfamiliar with. When we're more comfortable inviting them to church than we are inviting them into our own homes and lives, something is wrong. Peter's idea for the church is that we would love one another and within that community invite non-believers, those who don't know Jesus, into that community. Invite them in. Loving one another, belonging in Jesus and his family is not just how we survive as exiles, it's how we invite. The world needs to see that there's hope and that people can love each other in the most diverse ways possible. Peter's getting at this idea. Finally, he concludes this passage with this. You've been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable seed, eternal seed, through the living and abiding word of God, the message of Jesus, the gospel, the good news. And then he quotes Isaiah. He says, all flesh is like grass, and it's glory like the flowers of grass. Grass withers and flowers fall, but the word of the Lord remains forever. And this is the word, this is the good news which was preached to you. This Isaiah quotation came to Israel from the prophet Isaiah in the Old Testament when they were exiles in Babylon. And God made a promise to them, I will bring you back home one day. And my word endures, my word can be trusted, my word is eternal. The rulers of this world, their word is nothing but grass seeds and flower seeds. When fall and winter come, you wouldn't even know they existed, but my word endures forever and you can trust my word. Peter applies this to us, God will bring us home. The same message that we believed in, the hope of Jesus, is the message that will also take us home. And it's a permanent one at that. It is difficult to follow Jesus as an exile. Peter knows this. It is worth it to follow Jesus as an exile. Peter believes this. And Jesus is growing his family through one and two. As the world on the outside looks at us to see how we treat each other, how we love one another, how we talk, how we behave, how we conduct ourselves. Do we have hope which is inex in in inexpressible and, 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 and goes beyond comprehension, inexplainable? Do we have a perspective in this world that man, how do, they, how do they think that way? How do they love that way? Do we understand that our belonging is in a future home and not necessarily this home? This is Peter's call to us. Love is the key distinctive of holiness. So let's love each other. This is how we bring others in. This is, in Peter's mind, how we approach the world. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word, which is eternal, endures forever. Thank you for, uh, Jesus, thank you for saving us, for spilling your blood for us. Thank you for giving us a family and a home and a hope. Jesus, I pray that you would break and bend our hearts that we would love one another and invite others into this thing. Our faith was never meant to be this exclusive members only club if you know the rules, if you know the password. Jesus, you desire to grow your family and that family should be marked by love and hospitality. So Jesus, help us be set apart by the ways that we love. We ask this in your name.
Amen.